right, so in this lesson, we're going to look at photoreceptors and phototransduction. You might be going, what the heck is that? Well, let's define them then. Phototransduction is a process by which light energy is converted into a graded receptor potential. All right, so let's break that down. Basically, we're taking light and we're going to convert it into a action or a graded potential, not an action potential. If you remember, graded potentials are similar to action potentials. They just can't send a signal all the way down an axon, but they will. This graded potential that we're going to develop will lead eventually to an action potential um, down the ganglion's axon. The cells that start this whole process, of course, are the photoreceptors. These are the rods and cones and that are going to respond to the light or the photon of light. A photon is just a different way of looking at light instead of a wavelength. So let's look at the different structures of the rod and cone again. Uh, we looked at it a little bit briefly, but let's look at a little bit more detail. First, the outer segment. The outer segment is basically has a uh, consists of a bunch of discs um, that contain plasma membranes or made up of plasma membranes. And these plasma membranes contain photopigments buried in their membranes. Now the discs can be easily destroyed by light um, and so they have to be replaced. And they are replaced by, because they're made by the cell bodies and the cell body quickly replaces it. Now that happens for rods, that happens at night for cones, it happens, at, or excuse me, at the end of night. And then for cones, it happens at the end of the day. The inner segment consists of the cell body. Of course, that's the part that's going to make the um, photopigments for us. It also has a synaptic turn um, terminal. And then that synaptic terminal or snaps, it snaps is with the uh, bipolar cells. And then from the bipolar cells, they're going to synapse with the ganglion cells, if you remember. Now differences between rods and cones, again, we've looked at this a little bit, but let's see it in more detail. Um, first of all, rods, there's only one kind, one type of rod, but cones, there are actually three types and they differ. These four photoreceptor cells um, differ by how sensitive they are to light. So cones, there's actually three of them. They're, they're named red, green, and blue because they're more sensitive to those colors. Um, rods are only sensitive or are, are very sensitive to light um, so it doesn't take much light to get them to start this whole process of phototransduction whereas cones need a lot more light to be activated they're less sensitive um, but cones will give us our cone vision our color vision um, whereas rods are used mostly at night and in our peripheral vision, we'll use a little bit of them, um, but mostly again at night where we see black and white, so to speak. Okay, uh, rods also have a different way. They feed into the ganglion cell. Down here, you can see a bunch of rods here, and those rods then feed into fewer bipolar cells and these four bipolar cells feed into one ganglion cell. So if a photon of light hits, say, this rod, it's going to cause an action potential in the same ganglion cell as if this rod down at the bottom got hit by a photon of light. Same ganglion cell. So our brain doesn't know which one of all these rods actually got hit by that photon of light. So therefore, rods don't provide us with a very clear vision. Um, it's more fuzzy. It's not as sharp uh, as you get with the cones because the cones, on the other hand, notice the cones are hooked up to one bipolar, one ganglion cell. So if this cone hits, it sends an action potential in that ganglion cell and our brain can interpret that because it knows exactly which cone got hit. So this, we have much higher acute vision with our cones than we do with the rods. Here's a picture of the different sensitivities of the photopigments. Again, they're all sensitive different wavelengths of light. Of course, the blue cones more to the blue, the green cones in the green range, the red cones kind of over in the red range. And so what our brains does is interprets color based on the combination of, of cones 
um, that fire. For example, let's say yellow. Yellow, red cones are very sensitive to yellow. Green, somewhat sensitive. So a lot of reds would fire, very few greens would fire, um, but that combination our brain will interpret as yellow. Whereas if you come over here, um, let's say we're here in this kind of blue-green area, it's a lot of green, a few red, and that combination tells us we kind of a blue-green color. Okay, so you get that idea. The, if you have trouble seeing this number up here, then that indicates you're colorblind. Hopefully it comes across on the slide, but actually it's a number 15. You hear the one, and here's the five here. So what happens if you're colorblind, you lack one or more of the cone types. This is more common in males because it's an X-linked trait. So males only need one gene to say they're colorblind, whereas women need two genes to say they're colorblind. So it's much easier for a male to inherit just that one gene. It would have to be from the mother, um, and the mother may not be colorblind, she may be a carrier. So um, a lot more males that are colorblind than females. Most types of colorblindness is called is a red green color blindness where they don't have or ha either they don't have red and green cones or they lack or have a low number of them. Um, this picture down at the bottom here gives you kind of an idea of what it would be like if you were colorblind. You know, here we know the stop sign, but a colorblind person would see it like this to the right. So what they have, and if you never noticed specifically that the red is always on top, then yellow, then green, and it's always that order because that's the only way colorblind people would know whether to stop or go. Um, so now let's look at rhodopsin, the photopigment found in rods, and, um, and see what it looks like, and, and we'll concentrate on um, what goes on with rhodopsin. Keep in mind that you know each of the cones has their own photopigment, so there's actually three photopigments for the cones, depending on which cone it is, and then the fourth would be rhodopsin. And they'll have the same kind of thing going on in the cones that we see going on in the rods, but we're just gonna talk about the rods. So, uh, rhodopsin again is a visual pigment for of rods, is arranged in those membrane discs. So here's our membrane here, and this is the rhodopsin molecules, and little complex structures inside of making up this entire structure. So we'll again, look at that a little bit more. Now, um, the rhodopsin is composed of two things. Retinol, which is shown out here or buried inside, of the other part of it, which is in the red, and that's the opsin. So we have retinol and we have opsin make together combined to form rhodopsin. Now the retinol comes in two forms. One is what's called an 11-cis retinol, and the other is an all-trans retinol. Now if you've had organic chemistry, that might make sense to you because that's just an indication of the shape. If it doesn't, that's okay. Just think of it as two bizarre names for the different shapes that are possible for retinol. But keep in mind that 11 cis retinol is the shape that retinol takes in the dark. When a photon of light hits retinol, it causes the retinol to straighten out and become what's called the all trans retinol. Okay, so first, if we look what's going on in the dark, now all trans retinol since it's in the dark, is going to get converted right back to the 11 cis, so it's going to bend. And then that will allow any uh, retinol and opsin that have separated to reassemble. So they'll reassemble back into this form and start to accumulate in this form. Okay. Now in the light, however, that photon of light hits the 11 cis retinol, converts it to all trans, so the thing straightens out, that won't allow that retinol to sit inside the opsin anymore and the two break apart. Um, and then we'd have to go back to the dark to get these guys to reassemble back into our regular rhodopsin with that 11 cis retinol inside. Okay. Now it so happens that this conversion 
of the rhodopsin here from the 11 cis retinol to the all trans is a very fast reaction. Hit it with a photon of light, bam, it instantly stretches out to all trans and breaks apart. But to accumulate it back, to get rhodopsin back is a slow process. So I can break it apart real fast, but I'm going to be really slow about getting it back to rhodopsin. Now to kind of keep this straight, what I like to think of it is as I'm the retinol here curled up in fetal position, sleeping in the dark with the opsin blanket surrounding me. And then the light comes in in the morning and I wake up and stretch and that makes the blanket fall off. So that's kind of a way you can kind of keep track of, you know, are we talking about uh, retinol, 11 cis retinol or all trans retinol and which one is it that stretches out and gets the opsin to fall off. Okay. But the important thing to remember in this one is that when light hits that retinol or excuse me, the rhodopsin breaks apart. Okay. Now from there, then what happens? All right. So we can see here, here, first thing, light hits the visual pigment, our rhodopsin. It hits the rhodopsin, converts that 11 cis retinol to all trans. That activates a G protein. Now that G protein is called transducin. So this G protein is activated. The G protein or, that, or transducin then activates photo, phosphodiesterase. Phosphodiesterase's job is to convert cyclic GMP into GMP or to break cyclic GMP down. So now our cyclic GMP levels would start to fall. So the more light we have over here, the less cyclic GMP we've got. We're going to accumulate GMP. Now, why in the world do I give a crud that I'm losing cyclic GMP? Well, cyclic GMP's job is over here. Cyclic GMP's job is to attach to sodium channels and allow sodium to flow in. So remember, sodium's concentrated out, right? So if sodium's concentrated out here, this channel's open, sodium's going to move in. Now, when sodium moves in, that's going to be a depolarization, depolariz right? Depolarization as sodium flushes in. But now in this process, if when light hits, we activate transducin, transducin gets phosphodiesterase, we lose our cyclic GMP. If there's no cyclic GMP in here, this channel closes. So if the channel closes, sodium can't enter. If sodium can't enter, it ends up causing the cell to become hyperpolarized. So we'll do this again in a little bit. But what does that mean then? That seems kind of odd. We're always used to everything leading to depolarization to send signals down. Now we're going to have the opposite. Because remember, in a typical neuron, you stimulate or hit the neuron with a stimulus. That gets sodium channels to open up. And what do we have? Depolarization going on. Okay. But instead, I just told you now that when you get a stimulus of light, we end up not opening sodium channels, but closing them. So sodium can't enter. When sodium can't enter, then more and more sodium accumulates on the outside, which makes the cell hyperpolarized. And you can see on this graph over here that the more light that we have, the bigger the depolarization. Because the more light we have, if you remember, we're going to flip back to the previous slide, the more light that we hit here, the more transducin, the more transducin, the more phosphodiesterase, the more phosphodiesterase, the less cyclic GMP we have because phosphodiesterase breaks that cyclic GMP down. Less cyclic GMP, the fewer channels that are open. So we get over here, the brighter the light, the less sodium channels that are open because the less cyclic GMP we have and that would make even more and more hyperpolarized. Okay, now what the heck? Again, we're kind of used to this idea that we're expecting depolarization, but let me just say that a change in membrane potential 
is all the signal we need. It's a signal. It may not be the signal we're used to, but it's a signal. And so let's see where it goes from there. All right, so here we are in the dark, okay? Starting out with this. In the dark, sodium channels are open. Remember, because cyclic GMP is bound here, so sodium channels are open. If sodium channels are open, this cell is depolarized, okay? Whereas in the light, the sodium channels are closed because we lost all the cyclic GMP. So no sodium can enter. The sodium accumulates on the outside. Build up a sodium outside makes the outside really positive, meaning the inside is really negative, and so that makes it hyperpolarized. Okay. So the point of this, the thing you got to try to remember, is that in the dark, the rods depolarized. In the light, the rod is hyperpolarized. All right, so where do we go from there? Let's start with the dark again. First, again, rhodopsin's not broken down, so cyclic GMP's not broken down. Since cyclic GMP's not broken down, the cyclic GMP channel is open. It allows sodium, which is a cation. Calcium's involved too, but I'm just gonna concentrate on sodium and allows the sodium to move in and it causes this rod to be depolarized. If a rod is depolarized, then remember at a synapse, that triggers the release of calcium or opens calcium channels, so calcium rushes in at the synapse. This is a typical synaptic type of transmission. So that calcium then triggers a neurotransmitter to be released into the cleft. And you can see the little red dots there are all the neurotransmitters. Now this neurotransmitter is inhibitory. It causes an IPSP, an inhibitory postsynaptic potential on the bipolar cells. It it's, opens up potassium channels. So potassium rushes out. It hyperpolarizes this um, bipolar cell. If this guy is, by, is hyperpolarized, then the calcium channels down here at this synapse won't open up because it's hyperpolarized. Remember, you need depolarization to open up calcium channels here at the synapse. We have hyperpolarization so the calcium channels don't open. If the calcium channel doesn't open, then no neurotransmitter is released. If there's no neurotransmitter released, then there's no excitatory postsynaptic potential in the ganglion cell. If the ganglion cell doesn't have an EPSP, then there's no action potential going down the optic nerve, Okay, which kind of makes sense. So in the dark, nothing happens because I'm not getting hit by a photon of light, which means no signal at the end, right? That hopefully kind of makes sense. It's kind of a bizarre backwards way of going about it, but at least no light means no action potentials. Now what about in the light? Rhodopsin gets broken down in the light. That triggers the whole second messenger system and that cyclic GMP then is broken down. The cyclic GMP, since it's broken down, it can't keep the gates open, so the gates close. If the gates close, this cell is gonna become hyperpolarized because sodium keeps accumulating instead of diffusing in. If this is hyperpolarized, then down here at the synapse, the calcium can't move in at the synaptic terminal, right? Because it's hyperpolarized. If no calcium moving in, then no neurotransmitter released, which means the bipolar cell then is not being inhibited anymore. Since he's not being inhibited anymore, he gets depolarized. Since he's depolarized down at the synapse again, you've got calcium being, or calcium channels opening, calcium moves in. Now when calcium moves in, you get a neurotransmitter released. That neurotransmitter is excitatory, so it causes action potentials to be, pro to be propagated along this optic nerve, or actually this axon, and that would be part of the optic nerve. Okay? 
That's a lot to absorb. You might want to listen to this a few times to kind of get it down, but I think you'll get there with it if you take it step by step. So why can't we see in the dark see when we enter a dark room? Think about going from you know you're watching a movie and you want some more popcorn, so you're gonna go out into the lobby to get some popcorn. Oops, and then you go get the popcorn and then you come back. I almost forgot that part. Um, you go get the popcorn in the bright lobby, go back into the theater, you're trying to find your friends and you can't see them. Okay, so why is it it's not working? Well, um, what's going on here is what's called dark adaptation. Okay, the cones aren't working when you step back into the theater. Why? Because there's not enough light. Simply not enough light for those rods to work. The rods aren't working. Why? Well, you exhausted all of them. Those, when you went out into the lobby to get the popcorn, that bright light exhausted, hit all of those rods, broke every single bit of rhodopsin down, so that's all that all trans retinol and opsins are broken apart, and they and you're gone. It's done. They're all that all that rhodopsin is gone. So you go back into the dark, your cones don't work, and there's no rhodopsin to get your rods to work. So after about 20 to 30 minutes, okay, give or take, the rods will begin to work. Why? Because you build up your stores of rhodopsin. You're in the dark, you can get those at rhodopsin built back up, and you can see with the rods again. The cones still don't work. Why? Because there's just not enough light. So the cones aren't going to work. Okay? Now, th to avoid dark adaptation, often you find people work in red light. Red light doesn't stimulate rods, so the rhodopsin never gets broken down in a red light. Or at least less of the rhodopsin gets broken down in red light. And therefore, if you go step out of the plane and parachute down, you go out of the plane into the dark, you can still see as well as if you had been out in the dark for hours. So that gives you the advantage and you don't have to go through this process of dark adaptation. And here up here, this man's working um, on a, um, looks like a astronomy project and using red light to work by. Now the opposite of this is light adaptation. Light adaptation is going from the dark to the light. So let's say the point where you left the theater and you go in the lobby and it's kind of bright. Okay? Or if you go outside, you know, the room's dark and you might you turn on the light in the middle of the night. Your roommate's rude and turns the light on and you're going, oh, please, stop that. Okay? Um, so why is he squinting? Well, the rods and cones are instantaneously stimulated. In the dark, all the rhodopsin stores are going. Of course, all the cones have all their photopigments stored up because they have been used in the dark. And then you go out and blast your eyes with light. It's like, whoa, all of this light just flooding your eyes, causing all the rhodopsin to break down at once. Your cones are working, everything's working. It's like, and then you get this huge input of signals to your brain and it's like whoa too much and so it's, you have a glare and you can't see it takes about 60 seconds to get over it and by that point the cones are desensitized and they take over work so they've lost their oomph somewhat and the rods are completely exhausted all the rhodopsin's broken down so they're not functioning and now you can see as if it was just a normal any old day all right so that ends our lectures on the eye. The next lecture you'll be doing it, um, for the class is going to be on hearing, and we'll move there um, on the next lesson or, or video lecture.